We've come to the last stage. Um, I must say that one of the most wonderful things that's happened the last months have been the South African um, taking Israel to court. Uh, it's amazing. And one of the... And straight from the court, more or less, uh, comes uh, Craig Murray. Um, I should say that just before he was going to The Hague to, to observe here, he went to, to, um, he went to Reykjavik to talk about Julian Assange. And landing in Heathrow after that, he was stopped by the police, arrested and accused of plotting terrorism. Um, you know, um, you don't really believe it until you, you see it. And, and, and Craig is one of those you don't believe him before you see him. OK, Craig. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be here. I'd like to start with an apology, which is that I arrived very late and I, I missed nearly all the wonderful speakers um, today. Um, it's an extended apology because, um, unfortunately, I was at the Assange trial in London uh, this week, both inside the courtroom and taking part in a number of actions and demonstrations outside. And I, uh, I got very cold and very wet and uh, seemed to have picked up a chest infection. So I, I, I've not been very well and I'm having some breathing problems, which is why I'm, why I'm late here. And it also may affect me as I, as I go through, so please bear with me. Um, also, I never ever write a speech, and I, I never know what I'm going to say before I get to the podium. Um, and that doesn't work too badly when I'm quite well, but when I'm feeling ill anyway, I, you may suddenly find I'm talking about something completely uh, ir irrelevant. So uh, please, uh, pl please bear with me there too. And finally, uh, yes, on the um, uh, story of my arrest, it was all the fault of my good friend Ugmunder here, because um, uh, I was in uh, Reykjavik for a WikiLeaks meeting, and uh, we were in touch with him, and he said that there was a demonstration on Palestine, and did I want to go along? So uh, we went along and stood <laughs> again in the cold and wet uh, outside the Icelandic parliament for a Palestine demonstration. And then uh, returning, I was arrested by the police and asked why I had attended the Palestine demonstration. I said, because I support the people of Palestine. And they, they then asked me what had been said in the speeches at the demonstration. And I said, I have no idea. I don't speak Icelandic. But they, <laughs> um, but they, um, uh, they asked me about that. They asked me a lot of questions about WikiLeaks and the finances of WikiLeaks and my personal question. And under the Terrorism Act, uh, in the UK, you can be arrested and you are not entitled to a lawyer. And you have to answer questions. You have no right to remain silent. If you don't answer a question fully and truthfully, that in itself carries a two-year jail sentence. Uh, and they confiscated my electronics. Uh, they told me I was under um, further investigation for terrorism. I received a letter a couple of days later to say I was under investigation for terrorism. So I decided it was a good time to go on holiday and I left for Switzerland. And uh, <coughs> I stayed in Switzerland for the next four months, more or less. And I, I just went back for two days for the Assange hearing and then I've left again. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm here with you now. And I actually quite literally don't know where I'm going next. I don't know where I'm going tomorrow. It's, uh, it, it's uh, an exciting way to lead your life, but perhaps something has gone wrong in society when we have to do it. That's my, uh, that's my thought. Um, but now let me get into uh, what I was going to talk about. And I might come to talk about the, the ICJ hearings, because I was in the courtroom for the South African case um, against uh, Israel. And in fact, I had some hand in the fact that that case was brought, because um, I wrote a couple of articles, which I published in October um, on, and, and early November, on why, why does no state take Israel to court under the Genocide Convention, because that goes to the International Court of Justice, which is a, a genuine court. 
people are taking Israel to the International Criminal Court, which is a complete waste of time, because International Criminal Court is a disgusting, corrupt institution under the thumb of Western and NATO governments. There's no point whatsoever in going to the International Criminal Court. The International Court of Justice, much longer established institution uh, with a, a, a history of um, impartiality, uh, quite a good history, uh, much more chance of a result. And of course, if you, um, uh, if you succeed at the International Court of Justice, and the International Court of Justice eventually rules there is a genocide, which sadly won't be for a couple of years before we get to the, to the actual decision. But that then, it then becomes impossible for the International Criminal Court to ignore the genocide. The International Criminal Court would then be obliged to take action against individuals. So, so going to the uh, International Court of Justice is a kind of necessary first step. So I, I wrote articles explaining this, and they were picked up in London by um, Andrew Feinstein, former ANC uh, MP and activist there. And he sent those articles on to his friend, the South African Foreign Minister. And I'm happy to say that at the Cabinet meeting on the 8th of December, uh, when the Cabinet decided to go ahead with action against South Africa, against Israel, uh, my articles were on the, were on the Cabinet table. So um, I'm, 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 I think I'm probably prouder of that than of anything else I've achieved in my life. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Um, I want to talk about a couple of other things um, in my life because it, it's difficult when you follow so many extremely distinguished speakers. Uh, when I was a young diplomat in, in, in the British Foreign Office, Jeffrey Sachs taught me economics. Um, <clears throat> I think what I can best contribute is some things I saw myself of which I have personal knowledge and then try to draw some more general conclusions from those things. And I'd like to start by talking about some wars people perhaps never heard of, perhaps don't remember, but some lesser known, less famous wars. Um, and I want to talk about the war in Sierra Leone and Liberia in the mid-1990s. Um, I was the deputy head of the Africa Department of the British Foreign Office at that stage. Um, and with the war in Sierra Leone in particular, which was a civil war but also overlapped with the war in neighboring Liberia, um, it reached a stage where uh, we reached a stage of peace negotiations between the rebel forces and the government forces. Um, and I was appointed the head of the British delegation to those peace negotiations. Um, and there were various other governments involved. The Americans had a delegation. Um, the Libyans had a, a delegation. The American delegation was almost entirely CIA people. Um, the government and the rebel forces were both represented by some pretty nasty people. Um, and the government of, of Togo was cheering negotiations, which were held in, in Togo. They were held in Lome. Um, and I, got an, I was there for two months in the negotiations, and much of the time we were literally locked into a hotel. It was like being in prison. You know, I couldn't leave a hotel if I wished to leave the hotel. I got to know the president of Togo then, President Ayadema, quite interestingly. And he was an interesting man because he was the only head of state in modern times, I believe, who actually strangled his predecessor with his own hands. <laughs> um, and one day I was sat in this, um, I was sat in this room and we'd got the rebels here, we'd got the Sierra Leonean army here, we'd got the Libyan people here, we'd got the CIA there, we'd got president of Togo there. And I actually realized I was the only person in the room who had never killed anybody. <laughs> Which doesn't, it's not conducive to a sense of well-being. Um, anyway, one of the people who, who had killed a lot of people was um, a young Sierra Leonean soldier who's known as Colonel John. 
So he was, he was from a rebel RUF, from a rebel faction. And the, the war in Sierra Leone was terrible for reasons that were partly cultural and partly just the way it developed. It was characterized by an awful lot of mutilation. They, both sides, um, in fact, there, there were three or four different parties, so to say both sides is a simplification. But when they captured a village, they would amputate the limbs of all the people there, commonly. You, you know, they would go into a village and they would just chop everyone's arm off for me, for me elbow, for example. There were quite literally, I think, 40 to 50,000 amputees whose limbs had been hacked off with uh, machetes. Um, and there was a lot of absolutely random killing. Um, and one of the things we were trying to decide in the negotiation, the, the aim of the negotiation was to find a government of national unity. Um, and one of the things that was being discussed, the leader of the rebel factions was a guy named Fode Sanko. Um, and one of the things I discussed with him and with uh, the exiled president of Sierra Leone, President Kaba, was the idea that um, in a cabinet of about 18 ministers, the rebels would have seven ministers. Uh, but as part of the balancing act of that, which would make that acceptable to the people of Sierra Leone, a certain number of the rebels would be executed. Um, so the argument was, discussion was going on uh, with the rebel leader as to which of his lieutenants who were there supporting him he was secretly agreeing should be executed. Um, and one of them was this chap called Colonel John, who was only about 20, and who had killed a very large number of people. Um, I, I got to know him fairly well, because if you're trying to make peace in these circumstances, um, one of the fundamentals of conflict resolution is you have to establish personal relationships with the parties to the conflict. Um, and... Um, Colonel John, who was, i say, a very young man, maybe 20, um, he had personally killed dozens of people. I got to know him fairly well, and over the course of several evenings, spent drinking whiskey in this bar, in this hotel, we were locked in. He told me his, his life story. And when he was seven or eight years old, and he didn't know exactly, uh, the rebels had come to his village and they'd forced him to shoot his own mother and father. He'd then become a child soldier. He'd fought in Liberia, he'd fought in Sierra Leone. At one stage, with a whole squadron of them, and I had no previous idea this happened. I didn't know this sort of thing happened. Um, organized by Charles Taylor, a whole shipload of child soldiers was sent to join the war in Angola and fought there. He'd come back and continued fighting. He'd risen up through the ranks of the rebels. Um, he, couldn't remember, he couldn't tell me exactly how many people he'd killed. Um, but his job was, uh, his, his goal in life, you know, he thought peace would come and he'd be able to get an education. He'd be able to, because he couldn't read or write. He thought he would be able to get an education. He'd be able to go to school. Uh, those were the goals he still clung to even having led this terrible life and killed and tortured so many people, having come from a, a situation where he never stood a chance from the age of seven or eight. And how complex these situations are, how horrible war can be, is something which I think most of us never touch or never feel, and certainly the media never tells us. And... <coughs> I want to come to this. That war was largely about diamonds, uh, blood diamonds. The government, which my own government, the British government, was backing, was an extremely corrupt government. Um, that government had essentially sold the rights in most of the country's diamond mines to a mercenary group of British-led mercenary soldiers who um, kept control of the diamond fields, who themselves were terrible killers and rapists. 
Um, and Sierra Leone also has the world's largest rutile mine, R-U-T-I-L-E, which I, rutile is, is, is the ore from which I think you get platinum. I'm not sure if it's either platinum or palladium, but it's, it, it's a rare earth that you, you get an extremely valuable ore from. Um, and the British government eventually uh, invaded. Eventually, I did succeed in negotiating a peace settlement, and I'm happy to say nobody got executed as a result of the uh, peace settlement, which is perhaps the other thing in my life I'm most proud of. Um, the, it broke down after about a year, and then the British government invaded, sent, sent in the British armed forces, uh, and essentially took over, in effect, a colonial administration. They put British ministers into, into key positions. Um, and one thing you don't hear is that, you know, British industry, British commercial interests uh, became the owners of the extremely valuable Rutile mine. And one of the American ministers who was involved in the decision of the British invasion, a guy called Chester Crocker, who, who was a minister in the then Democrat administration, he became a director of the Rutile mine in his personal capacity. Not, not as a representative of the United States government, he became the part owner of the Rutile mine from this colonial invasion. Uh, and he had <coughs> ceased to be a minister just before that happened. Even more shockingly, a British minister, Baroness Amos, who I think went on to become head of the Commonwealth, um, um, became a director of the Rutile mine with a personal share in the Rutile mine while still a British minister. Um, and that tends to be what it's about. You know, that war, all that death, all that mutilation was about diamonds and mining and the desire of people to get them. And it ended with an exercise by Western Power. And the, the reason I'm telling you this, or one of the reasons I'm telling you this, is that that was presented unanimously by the British media as a fantastic success for Tony Blair, that he'd sent in the British forces and ended this war. And it was seen as a success for the doctrine of the right to protect, which actually is simply imperialism written again. Because if you read that, I'm, as it happens, I am uh, a historian who's written uh, history uh, connected to the British Empire. And Britain never, ever, ever invaded anywhere in order to seize its resources. It always did so for the good of the people of that country. It always did so to protect them from exploitation by local rulers or from possible invasion by the next country. Always, for centuries and centuries. And the so-called right to protect doctrine, which of course was the excuse under which Libya was destroyed by, the, by, by, by Hillary Clinton, um, the right to protect doctrine uh, is just imperialism writ large. But I, I tell you that from that little war, because it's an example of the fact that wars almost always come down to control of physical resources. And of course, we saw it in Iraq. I was British ambassador in Uzbekistan, where I ended my diplomatic career when I blew the whistle on torture and extraordinary rendition. And um, there, what we were doing, which was supposed to be about security and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda incidents were being fabricated by the British government. Intelligence on Al-Qaeda was being fabricated by the British government. This is why I resigned. I was trying to stop it. Um, in order to disguise the naked pursuit of Central Asian gas resources by, by the British and American government. So that's what it was actually about. And it's not a theory. No, it was about meetings and, and contracts, Enron, the American country Enron, got the contract for Uzbek gas while I was, uh, uh, while I was there. And there was a, um, a, a country, a company called, I think, Unical, uh, who were meant to build a trans-African uh, pipeline, sorry, a trans-Afghanistan pipeline to bring Central Asian gas out through Afghanistan, through Pakistan, and down to the Arabian Sea. Uh, and the director of that company was George Bush Sr. And that, of course, was, was a major reason why the, uh, the occupation of Afghanistan lasted that long. 
in, when they first had, had this scheme, uh, they actually were, had, <laughs> had a deal with the Taliban to protect the, uh, the, the pipeline. They went another way. Um, after after 9/11, but these things always come down. And as I say, it's not it's not theory. They come down to hard actual contracts for mineral resources, and that's what war is almost always about. We now see something in Gaza with the genocide that's happening there, which, if you like, is different in a sense to the war in Sierra Leone, and that people see it. People see the the atrocity. We've, we've all seen the, um, the streaming of it. Um, I've, um, I'm, I'm sure like many of you, I've cried many times over the last few, few months. I've just seen things, you know, just by glancing at my Twitter feed or whatever, you, you see things you just wish you'd never seen. Um, and it's extremely hard to come to terms with. And it does seem to be a change point in society because it does seem that for once the establishment has lost control of the narrative. Um, it, it, it does seem that it's very, very difficult of, for the Western political elite to, um, uh, to keep the lid on public and popular opinion over what is happening. You do have, I mean, I, forgive me, my, I, I'm not in the least knowledgeable about Norwegian politics and the Norwegian media scene. Um, but I did see the Norwegian intervention into the current ICJ hearing on the status of um, the occupied uh, territories of Palestine, and I thought the Norwegian intervention was was excellent. Uh, I, I, I must say, you do seem to have a state which has a much more moral position, at least than the state I am coming from. I'm, I'm sure it's not perfect, and more of you could t you could tell me more of it. But it 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 it, it at least recognizes uh, the rights of the Palestinians in some fundamental ways. Um, my government does none of that, the government of the, of, 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 of the United Kingdom. And I think we are seeing their desperation to keep hold. I mean, the fact they're you know, arresting somebody like me and investigating somebody like me for terrorism in order to silence me primarily on Palestine shows, in a sense, how desperate they are getting, and how it, it's not a sign of strength; it's a sign of weakness. That they they are so scared of the people, and that they are losing uh, control of the narrative. And I'd like to say something about the the narrative. I mean, it is astonishing how unanimous the mainstream media is in the UK in its support for Israel. Um, the BBC did a big expose in its flagship panorama documentary slot on Monday uh, about the situation in the Middle East. And what was the exposure on? The exposure was on support for Hamas and support for the October the 7th uh, massacre under by British Muslims. They, um, the BBC will never do a hard-hitting documentary on, on, on the actual genocide. They just won't. They, they are completely party P. We had a major political row um, in the House of Commons um, a couple of days ago when the Speaker of the House of Commons refused to call. It was the, the day of the Scottish National Party to put forward a motion. They get, I think, three days a month when they're allowed to put forward a motion. Uh, and on this one of their days, they chose to put forward a motion calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. That was embarrassing to the Labour Party because the Labour Party refuses to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and so the, the Speaker of the House of Commons, against all precedent, uh, refused to call the SNP motion, which they had a right to call under all parliamentary procedure. He just refused to call it. And he said, he then made a statement yesterday saying he had done so because of the danger to members of parliament because of the threats to members of parliament from pro-Palestinian supporters. Um, and that, of course, served several purposes. Firstly, it protected the Labour Party from the opprobrium it is due for its slavish support for, for Israel. Secondly, 
it served the narrative of promoting Islamophobia, of saying Muslims in particular are dangerous, other pro-Palestinian activists are, are dangerous, they are terrorists, MPs have to be protected from them. And the government is now, as a result of that, as a result of Parliament refusing to debate a motion calling for ceasefire in Gaza um, on the basis of this stupid excuse, the government are now putting through an emergency bill through the House of Commons to ban political protests near Parliament or near the offices or homes of members of Parliament. Um, because that's all they've got, basically. They've lost control of the narrative. Nobody believes what they say anymore. Uh, and all they can do is repression after repression after repression to try to clamp down on and ban and, and make a legal opposition. I, I want to move quickly over to Julian Assange and what's been happening with him, because this goes into the very heart of what Julian has always stood for, which is the right of the public to know what governments are doing and know why governments are, are, are doing it, and to, to stop governments lying and covering up, and st to stop the media being able to promote the government narrative without anybody being able to know the actual truth. Um, so this fits in very much with that. When WikiLeaks came out with the Chelsea Manning revelations, which, goodness me, it, it's now 15, 16 years ago, it, it, time has, has gone. This actually makes it quite difficult. I go speak in universities, and um, it's very easy to lose, to lose track of the fact that um, if you speak about these matters uh, in universities to people, um, many of them now weren't even born when the United States invaded Iraq. Uh, many of them were toddlers when the Chelsea Manning revelations were released by WikiLeaks. It's very hard to get a connection. You end up starting by having to explain the whole history to them first. Um, in a sense, um, the radicalization um, of young people by what they are seeing from Gaza, because young people are more than anybody else seeing the disconnect between what is really happening in Gaza and what the mainstream media are telling them and what the political class are telling them. And that is extremely uh, important, awakening uh, among young Europeans. And, and it's happening even in states like Germany, which have an absolutely appalling, um, essentially, pro-genocide legal system, uh, which is doing everything it possibly can to, uh, to uh, criminalize and suppress um, pro-Palestinian sentiment. Um, so there is starting to be um, a much greater understanding of these issues um, among younger people. But back at the time of the Chelsea Manning revelations, we had a belief that the internet was going to set us free. You know, those of us active, both on the WikiLeaks side of publishing classified information and just in, in blogging and alternative social media, you know, we could see that the mainstream media readership, it's both online and on broadcast, was falling and falling. We could see that um, readership of of blogs and alternative news sources was rising. And it was a time of, of great hope. Some of that hope is now rather dissipated because we didn't account for or expect the corporatization of uh, the internet and the fact that the internet is now so thoroughly dominated by corporate gatekeepers. Um, to give an example, when I wrote up um, Julian's first major extradition hearings um, at Woolwich Crown Court, I was getting, on my own website, I was getting one and a half to two million people a day reading my daily reports, just on my own website. Um, and most of those were coming um, to me from Google, from Facebook, from various other ways, but they, they were coming quite freely. Um, 
nowadays, I've just um, finished uh, the report of the Thursday of Julian's latest appeal hearing. And rather than like two million people on my own website, it's being seen by 60,000 people on my own website. And that's because you won't find my website on Google because it's completely suppressed on, on Google. It's because on Twitter uh, and on Facebook, the suppression is at astonishing levels. WikiLeaks themselves have five million followers. Um, they put out a tweet linking to my article and of their five million followers, uh, it, that tweet was seen by 25,000 people, uh, despite having 3,000 retweets. Uh, it's the same uh, with my own uh, Twitter access. It's been restricted down and down and down. And, and one thing, and it's very easy to show examples, um, if you put out a pro-Israeli tweet um, on Israel, and I've looked for examples, let, let, let's, on Twitter, you put out a pro-Israeli tweet and you get 2,000 retweets. From 2,000 retweets, it will be seen by about 10 million people. Uh, if you put out a pro-Palestinian tweet and you get 2,000 retweets, um, from 2,000 retweets, it'll be seen by about 75,000 people. 75,000 as against 10 million from the same number of retweets. And it's very plainly by subject matter, and it's very plainly by who you support. And the, the difficulty with the fact, and now, um, just because of the way the internet has developed, over 90% of the people who come to my website come through um, one of the big corporate uh, gateways. They come through uh, Facebook or they come through Twitter. So if, if you cut that down, you're cutting off my, my access. And that's true of really all of the, the radical internet alternative media. Um, and that, again, that's, that's different. A few years ago, it wasn't that way. An awful lot of people would come by a search or simply by typing in your name and, and, and coming direct by the URL. The way people access internet is difficult and is, is, has changed. Um, this makes fighting against uh, media suppression of the truth an uphill struggle. It makes it really very hard. I, I genuinely, we have many of us uh, and, and there are many great people who are on um, Substack or, or other platforms. And between us, we have a big, big audience, and particularly in the United States. Uh, a culture is growing whereby people go straight to their favorite person online. Um, but it still doesn't bring us the numbers that the, that the media get for pumping out of lies. And the last thing I want to talk about is the way that the political class no longer offers any choice in democracy. If you live in the United Kingdom, you count with Gaza the biggest um, uh, Gaza the biggest story of all at the moment. You have a main political party which, which actively supports the genocide, which actively opposes ceasefire, and which actively supports sending arms to Israel. And you have a main opposition party which actively supports the genocide, which actively opposes a, a ceasefire uh, and um, actively supports sending weapons to Israel. The same is exactly true in the United States of America, um, where both the Democrats and Republicans vie with each other uh, to be seen, uh, to be most vocal in their support for Israel. And you can read that across economic policy. You can read that across almost every policy. We, are, we live in a state in the West where not only is the amount of policy choice on any given, given subject, which is debated and allowed a voice in the mainstream media, extremely narrow. The same is true of the so-called choice offered by party systems at elections. You basically don't get to vote to anybody who's going to do anything effectively different. You're, you're voting for a change of personnel. Perhaps at best, you're voting for whoever benefits from the corruption. 
Um, it's very difficult to see how Western society finds a way forward out of this. It seems to me in the period where it's now that the Financial Times was running a prediction that within five years the world will have its first trillionaire. Trillionaires. Within five years somebody is going to be worth a trillion dollars. And even in wealthy countries we have people who are starving. I was in Strasbourg uh, lobbying for Julian at the European Parliament a couple of weeks ago. Walking back to my hotel, I had to literally walk over and round people who were sleeping in the street in the cold. Uh, in Strasbourg, in a, a wealthy nation right at the heart of Europe. And yet we have people who are worth trillions. Something has become fundamentally rotten in Western society. It is not in any longer functioning as a meaningful democracy. It's not any longer functioning uh, in a way that meets the needs of its people. And it's not any longer functioning in a way that gives its people choice. And one of the results of that is that the elite political class is becoming more and more scared of their own people. And one of the results of that is an increasing cycle of repression. And I'm not here to give you an answer, because I don't have an answer. I don't know how we get out of this. I think the, the Western liberal model of society has broken and is heading for catastrophe. Change will come. But when change comes in those circumstances, it's generally speaking uh, not simple nor pleasant. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.